Lord, everyone. Aren't you excited about being here at Cornerstone this morning? No, 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 really. Are you excited about being here? Yeah, you're too old for this. I don't know. We got this. Welcome to Youth Takeover Service. This morning, why don't you stand to your feet? We invite you to come up to the front, lift up your hands, lift up your voice this morning. Clap your hands this morning. Yeah. 
like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. To the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. My This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified This is my testimony, this is my testimony Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood, bought with blood and washed in water. Oh, we sing the praises, sing the praises of the everlasting Father. My God will finish what He started. Oh, we believe that. My God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony. everyone here to all of our guests and first time visitors we love to have you here there's no better place that you could be than the house of God on a Sunday morning right now why don't we step out of our aisle shake hands talk to a few people you haven't said hi yet to
If y'all can make your way back to your seats, we have a couple of announcements. Everyone say next week, August 20th, we have our group fair. Bring a friend. It's going to be amazing fellowship and a blessed word of God. And starting today, we have our media fast. So we all get to eat again, thank God. And two weeks ago, the youth and the hyphen went on an NYC trip. I went, and it was really good. It was a blessed time, a mighty move of God, and I honestly feel like it changed people's lives. And we're actually going to have a couple people who went to NYC come up and testify about their time. So for my first time at NYC, it was uh, like a really fun experience, you know. Uh, just going to a crowd with like over 30,000 people, just like all praising the Lord is just amazing, you know. I, I had fun, you know. I met people I've known, people I've never known, you know. We just, just had fun, you know. <laughs> I uh, One of my... Uh, favorite experience from the whole thing was probably the last night where after the entire service like the spirit just broke through and we just all just praised the Lord together which is probably all we could do you know we love the Lord you know so you know yeah. well this was my second year at NYC. the first year I was 14 and now this year I was 17 I love the time that I got to hang out with my friends after the services and between because there's one in the morning and at night. And I loved how much, like, we got so much closer together. I, the favorite, my favorite part of the services was when, the, when they sing the songs. So, like, I love worshiping and singing along to the songs. But one service that stuck with, with me was, like, the first one in the morning, oh, in the night, my bad, that they talked about, like, you can't snooze the alarm. And like, I understood that you can't snooze on God. Like if he tells you something, you just have to listen to him. You can't push him away and you can't just ignore him, like snoozing the alarm. Yeah. Good morning. So NYC was the first youth Congress that I've been to and I had a great time. I hung out with a lot of amazing people and I got to feel the presence of God every day for three days in a row. And I give thanks to the Lord because I almost couldn't go. My family couldn't afford the trip on time, so, but I didn't lose faith. I kept praying, and the days were getting closer and closer to the trip, and I was starting to lose a little bit of faith, but I kept praying. And just three days before the trip, Sister Jessica called me and said that somebody wanted to sponsor me to go. So, and I was, I was really excited um, because I knew that God was listening to my prayers. And... I, so I packed up my bags and cleaned my room as fast as I could. And you can ask my mom, I take the longest to do anything. So, <laughs> and um, I was a little nervous flying to a different state with a group of people that I only met almost a year ago. But if God calls me, I don't know about you, but I'm running. So, <laughs> we, went, we went to every morning and night service, but the very last service was the most memorable for me. The preaching was, the drought is over, and here come the apostolics. It was amazing to see and feel the Holy Spirit move around the whole stadium, filling almost everyone there with the Holy Ghost. It was an experience I'll never forget. And there's just something about ugly crying, shouting, and worshiping the Lord, to laughing, being very competitive at board games, and eating Chipotle burritos with a group of people that connect them. Not only did God give me an opportunity to have a fun trip and build new friendships, but he also gave me a chance to better my relationship with the Lord. Thank you. Amen, amen. Give him a hand clap. Give him a hand clap. God is really working in our young people. As the singers come back up, why don't you all make your way to the front altar, lift your hands, raise your voice to God, and get back in the presence of the Lord.
upon in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children Church, can you lift that up to this morning? Amen, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, if you received that blessing this morning, can you clap your hands? Come on, can you put some faith on your praise this morning and give the Lord some praise? He's worthy of all praise this morning. All glory and honor be to you, Jesus. You and you alone are worthy of all praise, God. We exalt you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. Amen, I like what I feel in the house this morning, amen. Anyone feel that spirit that's here? Amen, awesome. Can we give it up for this praise team this morning? Woo-hoo! Amen. The, the future of the church is in good hands. Amen. I'm, I am proud of them. Let me tell you what. They did such an amazing job today being sensitive to the Holy Ghost. I want to give honor to Sister Elise Saunders and Olivia Hayworth for heading up those practices. And they did such a great job. That was awesome. Thank you for being here. Look to your neighbor say, you're in the right place. Turn to your other neighbor say, I'm glad you're here. Amen, amen. I'm thankful to be in the house of God today on a Sunday morning. No better place than you could be. Amen. I'm excited to see what God has for us today. 
thankful for my pastor today. Anyone else thankful for their pastor? I love our pastor and pastor's wife so much. Our bishop, are you thankful for our bishop today? I give honor to them. Amen. I give honor to you for being here today. Amen. Taking time out of your day to be here. Amen. You are going to be blessed today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to read from the sixth chapter, the book of John, John 6 and verse 1, a familiar portion of scripture. It says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those that were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain. There he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy these bread that these may eat? But he said this to him to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, said, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may have a little. Then one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. And now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down and number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those that were sitting, and likewise of the fish, as many as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciple, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. It is my intention this morning to preach to some students on this Back to School Sunday Young people, we've had a Jesus Pack summer, right? We've had NAYC, we've had back to school weekend, youth services camp, so you should be filled up with the Holy Ghost at this point. I've not come to say what every other summer conference speaker has said. I've not come to try to convince you to have a walk with God. I'm here to encourage you today to influence somebody with that Holy Ghost that's inside of you. I'm here this morning to deputize you to go out and witness to your peers, to go out and witness to your neighbors to encourage you to preach and share Jesus to those in the highways and byways. And elder folks, grown folks, amen. I, have, I, have, I know that you've been out of school for quite some time, but God has a challenge for us this morning too, all right? This morning, I want to preach to you from the title of It Just Takes One. It Just Takes One. Can you lift up your hands and ask God to have his way this morning? He's already here. Let's ask him to, to sensitive our hearts that he might receive the glory today. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you soften every heart, that you soften every mind, God, that you allow our ears to hear what you'd say to us this morning, God. Let your will be done. Let it be accomplished in this service. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you're going to help me preach, say amen. amen. Clap your hands as you're seated. In Jesus' name. Amen. School started back this week in Marion County Public Schools. How many students are excited about that? How many parents are excited that school has started back? I knew that that was going to happen. I remember the anxiety of the first week of school. I used to tell my teachers when I worked in the school system, the first week is just about survival. It's just get them there, get them fed, and get them home, right? Make sure everyone gets home safely. Uh, Just... I remember when I was in school, not too long ago, like a few years ago, I remember there was this kind of crazy balance between anxiety and excitement, right, that went along with the first week of school. You were concerned about your teachers. Which teacher did you have? Did you have the same class as your friends, right? Were the teachers that you had good? Were they nice? Were they cool? Were they mean? Because with regard to mean teachers, every student knows that it just takes one to ruin your school year, right? And everyone is rocking the freshest fits, on the first day of school. Everyone has their new sneakers that are debuting. Everyone is just walking around like this because they don't want to crease their shoes. Some of y'all old folks don't know about that. I learned about this. They will waddle like a penguin to class because they don't want the shoes to crease because every student knows, every sneakerhead knows, with creases it just takes one to ruin your shoes. The first few weeks of school are always fun because we have pep rallies and we have, we have parties. One year when I was a dean in in Tampa, there was a teacher that threw this concert, and the kids were in the cafeteria having a good time, and they were dancing, and one kid was dancing so hard that he dislocated his knee and came to me screaming in agonizing pain. I had to rush him to the ER, and I told the kids, this is why we can't have nice things, because it just takes one student to mess it up. 
Sister Hudolf was playing a game with her kids in the class. She was playing head, shoulders, knees, and cup. And you're facing off against somebody, and the, the director says head, shoulders, knees. And then when they say cup, whoever grabs the cup, the fastest wins. And so this student, wanting to win, dove onto the cup, smashing his face onto the concrete, breaking his teeth. And he had to go to the dentist that day, and they no longer were able to play that game because it just takes one person to mess it up. But school is a unique place, a place that people love and a place that people hate, a place that is exciting and yet at the same time a place that's boring, right? a place that is kind of a micro closet of drama or situations are amplified and things that seem like a really big deal maybe aren't so much of a big deal. But school is also a place of unique opportunity, especially for a Christian, because school is a place where people are still searching for something. Our school is an environment where people are still trying to determine who they are. As a former educator, I can confidently say that school is a place where students are still discovering their identity. Their viewpoints and their outlooks are still being molded. They're impressionable. They're easily influenced. Young people understand me. Those students in your class that seem like they have it all figured out, they really don't. Those honor roll students, those popular kids, it seemed like they, they are lacking for nothing. They are looking for something. They're searching for something. And it just takes one person to come along and offer something, offer an answer. doesn't matter whether the answer is right or whether the answer is wrong. They are just happy to have something to help them self-identify. I know students that became addicted to drugs before they ever got to high school because it just takes one lapse of judgment. I worked with a 16-year-old student that had seven children from seven different mothers because it just takes one bad decision. I worked with students that shot their classmates from rival gangs and from drug deals gone bad because it just takes one mistake to land you headed the wrong direction. It just takes one person to come along and offer a solution to a young person that is searching for something. It just takes one person to come along and to present a quick fix to numb the pain from past trauma. Just takes one person to come along and offer relief in a substance or in a bottle. You can set your young people on a trajectory towards hell. But at the same time, it just takes one young person filled with the Holy Ghost that can spark a revival in your classroom. It just takes one apostolic, Holy Ghost-filled young person that said, you know what, this is my classroom in the name of Jesus, and you can see the Lord work in your school. Those young people in your class need what you have. Those young people in your neighborhood, those young people that you play Xbox with and that are on your sports teams, they need what you have, young people. They need a church family like this. They, they need a pastor like ours. If you have the Holy Ghost, you have what they need this morning. They may not realize it, but they are searching for something, searching for the joy that you feel, searching for the peace that you experience on a regular basis. They may think they have it all figured out, but they're missing the love of Jesus in their life, and they just need someone to share it with them. So I ask you this question this morning. Are you willing to share that which has been shared with you? It just takes one willing person. Church, can I remind you, that person on your job needs what you have. That person in your neighborhood needs what you have. That rude and nasty person that you interact with on an every base, everyday basis, they just need what you've got, amen? They just are missing that peace that we experience. They're missing that joy that we experience. It just takes one person that's willing to share it with them. Are you willing to share that which has been shared with you? The little lad in John 6 was. In our opening text, we read of this multitude that's following Jesus because they saw him heal people and perform miracles. I don't know about you, but if I saw Jesus walking around healing people, I'd be following him too. But the crowd had grown so large that it exceeded 5,000. That's just the men. That's not even including the women and the children, right? But some of them had been walking for quite some time, and so they were hungry. And if this past week has proven anything to us, I can just sit around and be hungry. So I can't imagine walking for days and being hungry, right? And so Jesus sees them, and he asks, uh, he asks Philip, what are we gonna, where are we going to buy these people bread? And Philip is kind of uh, logistically thinking. He's like, well, if uh, 200 denarii is, is, is not even enough to buy these people a snack, and for those that don't know, a Daenerys was a day's wage, so 200 denarii is a good portion of a yearly salary, right? And so he's, poor, he's just trying to be logistical. He's trying to be logical here. He's like, we just don't have enough money to buy bread for these people, right? And it was, it was about this time that Andrew presented an impractical solution. He said, hey, there, there's a lad here 
He's got five loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? We kind of see this like intrinsic struggle within Andrew. He's, he's, he's grasping at straws to offer some semblance of a solution. Now, obviously, this, this lad made it known to Andrew that he had something to offer. This lad had communicated a desire to help. The lad expressed a willingness to give of what had been given to him. In reality, he did not have much to offer. If we're being honest, I can eat five loaves and two fish and not think twice about it, right? He didn't really have much to bring to the table. He, he didn't have a whole lot to offer, but something said within him, he said, you know what? I don't have a whole lot to offer, but you can have what I have. You, you can have what, what I have. If I can say it like this this morning, uh, I may not be able to sing like everybody else, but you can have what I've got, Jesus. I may not be able to preach like everybody else, Jesus, but you can have what I have, God. I, I may not come from the right family. I, I may not have the right last name. I, I don't know the Bible quite like everyone else, but you can have what I have, Jesus. You can have my loaves and my fish, God. Jesus is just looking for someone, looking for someone that's willing to express some availability for him. Amen. He's not concerned about your ability. He just needs your availability, young person. He's just looking for someone to offer that which has been given to him that he might multiply it. If I can refuse Matthew 25, he isn't concerned with how many talents you've been given. He's just concerned with what you do with them. Right? Are you going to bury them? Are you going to go out and make something of them? It doesn't matter how much you have or how much you have not. You can have two loaves or two fish, two talents. It doesn't matter. God just wants to see what you're willing to allow him to work with. That young boy's faith and his willingness to submit to God resulted in a miracle that's still being preached about 2,000 years later. I want to preach to a young person today. If you have the Holy Ghost living inside of you, you have power. Acts 1 and 8 says you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The power to do what? The power to be a witness. Amen. You have the ability to influence your classrooms, young person. You have the ability to influence those at your school. You have the ability to stand out in the crowd. The ability is there, but this morning I ask, is the availability there? Are you willing to give what has been freely given to you? Are you willing to step out in faith and share Jesus with someone at school this year? Jesus was able to use the faith of a young boy to perform a miracle that would bless 5,000, over 5,000, because it just takes one. I want to prophesy in the Holy Ghost that he can do the same thing this morning with a young person's faith. He can honor the faith of a young person that's going to bless 5,000 5, or more, amen, in the school system this year. The masses are out there. The crowd is hungry. And Jesus is just as accessible and willing to feed as he was five, as 2,000 years ago. The only question is, is there a lad available? Is there a young lady available this morning? Because heaven knows it just takes one. Just think, I don't know if the lad really knew what he was signing up for. Jesus didn't say, does anyone have food that I might multiply it? He didn't say that, right? The lad just saw an opportunity and said, you can have what I have. And I would, I would imagine that this probably wasn't the first time that he was willing to sacrifice. I imagine that this wasn't the first time that he was willing to share, but this time was different because Jesus was there. Can I, can I tell you this young person, NAYC is great. Camp is great. Back to school rallies are great, but we don't live there, right? We live on Monday morning and Tuesday morning. And Brother Drew Galloway said it yesterday. Those experiences are wonderful, but they're not everyday life, Right? There are only two instances in Scripture where Jesus breaks bread and, and multiplies it to feed thousands. We don't live in those moments. We don't live in those experiences. Sometimes you're going to offer your loaves and fish, and you're not going to get anything in return but hunger. Sometimes you're, you're going you're to try to put yourself out there, and you know what? It's not going to work out the way that you thought it would. Sometimes you're, you're going to try to live holy and modest, and you might get made fun of. Sometimes you might try to share Jesus with someone and they might shoot you down. But you know what? The time that you extend your faith and God shows up and multiplies it, it makes it all worth it. Amen? Mother, Father, can I speak to you for a minute this morning? God's looking for the same availability in you. What's interesting is we don't really read a whole lot about the lad's parents in John 6, but we can infer based off of what we read what might have happened. I would assume that he wasn't there on his own being that he was young, I would assume that likely because they were so far away from the city that his parents were likely there with him. I would assume that it wasn't the lad's idea to wake up and said, Mom and Dad, we're going to see Jesus. Pack your stuff. Now, unlike today, kids didn't tell their parents what to do back then. But I would imagine that it was the parents' decision that landed the lad in position to receive a miracle. Because the parents were in the right place. 
the lad was in the right place. Because the parents were near to Jesus, the lad was near to Jesus. Amen? Hear me this morning. Because the parents said, you know what? We're going we're gonna to put ourselves in position to receive a miracle. Our family, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And it resulted in a miracle that blessed others. Mother, father, grandparent, your decisions impact your family. Your decisions, your choices affect your family. It just takes one decision to send your family down the right way or the wrong way. Your decision and indecision affects your household. If you want your children to have a walk with God, you better have a walk with God. If you want your child to be close to Jesus, you better be close to Jesus. Amen. If you want your child to know how to pray, you better know how to pray. If you want your child to read the word of God, you had better crack open the Bible and read it yourself. Amen. Amen. Hear the heart of this youth pastor this morning. I, I love your kids. I love them very much. Don't, don't just drop them off at a, a youth service on Friday night once a month, though, and expect everything to work out, right? They need your influence every day. They need your example. They, they glean more from you than they do anything else. Nothing will ever replace a mother and a father that are willing to stand in the gap for their children. Amen. I am here this morning because I had a mother that wasn't afraid to offend me. I'm here this morning because I had a mother that knew how to pray. Amen. I'm here because I had a father that could communicate the difference between right and wrong. I'm here this morning because I had grandparents that preached truth and then lived it out. Amen. Your decisions and your indecision reflect in the lives of your children. Hallelujah. Not only was that young lad present, but he also had something to offer. I'm sure that he didn't bake those five barley loaves on his own. Uh, maybe he was a good fisherman, but I'm sure he didn't get out in the boat, go catch the fish, and then prepare it. No, somebody else packed his lunch for him. Somebody else prepared him, right? If you want your young people to have something to offer the kingdom, if you want them to be able to stand up when someone needs a miracle, you better make sure that you equip them properly, family. You better make sure that you prepare them properly. You better make sure that they know the word. You better make sure they know how to touch God, how to pray. They will be able to invest in others because you invested in them. You should be concerned about your child's education. Believe me, I, I believe it. You should be concerned with their extracurricular activities. You should be concerned as to whether or not they're having a good life and having fun, right? But you should also be concerned with their spiritual walk, their spiritual well-being. More than anything else, a God-fearing home, God-fearing parents are necessary. They make a difference. An involved home makes a difference. I remember when I caught in the school system, the students that were successful most of the time had a support system at home, whether it was a parent or a grandparent, even an older sibling. Someone was holding them accountable. Someone was sending them to school. Someone was making sure they got their assignments done, and they were successful. And all the educators in the room can attest to the fact on the other side of that, the students that were not successful did not have a support system. Their parents would drop them off inconsistency. There was no fidelity with their homework. And what happened to those kids? They failed cannot stress the value of a support system. The young people need a spiritual support system. They need a pastor. Yes, they do. And we have a great pastor here. They need a youth pastor, but they need a support system that's at home in their spiritual corner and need a church full of elders that are willing to look out for them and pray for them. Amen. I know this is back to school service, but I want to speak to an older generation right now. These young people on these first few rows, these young adults on the platform, they need you. They need you. They need your support. They need your prayers. They need your example. They need your reproof. When I was coming up, my great-grandma, she passed at 94. My grandmother, Sister Warren's mother. And when I was coming up in church, boy, Grandma Thompson didn't play. And so that was when we had pews. And if a, co a child was causing commotion or disruption, she got up and everybody's head turned. Nobody was paying attention to the preacher anymore. And everyone was looking at Grandma Thompson. Grandma Thompson would come up to the front row, and she'd shake her finger. She'd wag it in their face. She said, that's not how we behave in church. And they would stop, right? And if they didn't, she persuaded them. Let's just say that. And that's just the kids she knew. If she didn't know them, she would go up, and she'd just scooch right in there and sit right next to them on the pew in this passive-aggressive way of saying, all right now, stop. Right? Adults better watch out, too. Nobody was safe. Why do you think she did that? Do you think that she's just a grumpy old lady? No, she did it because she loved them. She did it because she valued them. She, she did it because she valued the house of God, and she knew how important it was for them to be in the house of God. She wanted them to get the most of that experience, right? 
If we circle back to John 6, we read that Andrew is the one that presents the solution of the lad's lunch. The, the boy didn't just walk up to Jesus and say, here are my loaves and fish. No, but he needed the endorsement of an elder. He needed the endorsement of someone from an older generation. Andrew, who some considered to be the oldest disciple, even older than his married brother Peter, saw enough possibility in what the lad had to offer that he brought it to the attention of Jesus. The lad is the one who receives the credit right, for his faith, but without Andrew, who knows if this miracle would have ever taken place without the support of an elder, without the support of an older generation, he may have never had the opportunity to be used of God. Psalms 145 and 4 says, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Hear me, seasoned saint. Hear me this morning, elder. These young people need you. This, this church, these young adults need you. This young preacher right here, I need you. Amen. I need you. Your prayers bring value. Your encouragement brings value. Your endorsement brings value. Amen. You matter to this church. Acts 2, 17, and it shall come to pass that in the last day, saith the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, right? And your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream dreams, right? They're both in it together, right? Because when the Holy Ghost is poured out, we're united together with one collective purpose, right? One collective goal. We're, we're bound together, right, with love, right, with one, one desire, that is to, to see the, the will of God fulfilled, Amen. There are things that we cannot accomplish on our own without the other generation. There are things that these young people cannot achieve on their own without the support of the elders. And there are things the elders cannot accomplish on their own without the support of the young people. We are in this together. Amen. We need one another. Amen. Amen. My helpers, if, if you're able to come on up and go ahead and put yourselves in position to do that. The lad had to make himself available. But before he could do that, his parents had to get him to the right place. And they had to equip him. And following his willingness to give of what had been given to him, he needed the support of an elder. He needed the support of an elder. He allowed everyone, God allowed everyone to play a role in this. All of these elements, all of these individuals played a role in this miracle. And he wants to do the same thing in this church. Amen. There is a crowd out there that needs to be fed. There is a city out there that needs Jesus. There are over 40,000 students in Marion County Public Schools over 40,000, that's not even including those in private schools and, and charter schools, not even including those in Christian schools. The crowd is out there. The, the, the hungry mass is out there, right? There are souls out there that need Jesus. Amen. Elders, these young people can win souls this year. I believe they're going to do it. I believe they're going to go into their classrooms, and I believe they're going to make a difference. Amen. I believe it's going to happen. <laughs> Musicians, you can come. I believe it's going to happen, but they can't do it without the support of an elder. They need your support. They need someone to advocate for them. I want to share a story with you that I found was very interesting. A few, a few years ago in the town of Segarcha, Romania, tragedy struck as a three-year-old boy was wandering on his property and fell into a well pipe some 50 feet down into the earth. Now, Sagarcha, Romania, is a small town, about 8,000 people, and so when one of their own was in distress, the whole town was there supporting. The whole town was there trying to offer some help. But the pipe was so narrow that rescuers were unable to traverse down the pipe to retrieve the toddler. The child's father stood there feeling helpless alongside the pipe as he heard the desperate wails of his son below. Imagine the fear that might have gripped his heart. Imagine knowing that your child needed help but being unable to reach down and save them. For 11 hours, rescuers attempted to retrieve the child with various methods. They, they tried to lower down ropes, and they, they tied different knots, and they, they even lowered down harnesses. At one point, they got an excavator out there and were trying to dig the pipe out of the ground. But time was running out as the child started to become hypothermic. Hope seemed lost as the citizens of Segarcha stood there helplessly awaiting a miracle, not knowing what to do. It was about this time that a 14-year-old teenager named Christian, oddly enough, was coming home from school. He stopped when he saw all the commotion and quickly learned about the tragic scenario that had been unfolding. Rescuers came to the decision that the only viable solution would be to send a very skinny teenager, quote, down the pipe. Two teenagers initially volunteered, but they reluctantly decided against it after they looked down the pipe and realized what was going to be required of them. 
But a young Christian spoke up and volunteered to get the child. No doubt battling his own fear, Christian just focused on the child down there, trapped, unable for anyone to save him. The rescuers eventually lowered Christian, harnesses around his waist, harnesses around his legs, head first, some 50 feet into the darkness of the earth. Everyone held their breath, what seemed like an eternity, until Christian tapped his foot along the pipe, and they began pulling him up. I can imagine that in those minutes, the parents are thinking, does he have my baby? Was there enough rope? Did, was he able to reach him? Was he able to, was he able to get down? I can't hear down. It's too far down. I don't, I don't know what's going on. But just a few moments later, as the parents were frantically holding on to what little hope was left, Christian emerged from the pipe, feet first, holding the toddler in his arms. A toddler was then rushed to the hospital where he made a full recovery just a few days later. What an amazing story. What a miracle. That young child is alive today, not because of the crowds that surrounded the pipe, not because of the people that had good intentions. Right? He's alive today because of the heroism of a 14-year-old boy named Christian. Just one boy. The mother and the father of the child in distress. They didn't go out and interview teenagers. They didn't say, well, are you, are you athletic enough? And what family does this teenager come from? And uh, how much uh, experience do you have spelunking in well pipes? No, they were just looking for somebody because they knew it just takes one. It just takes one person, one person that makes up their mind and says, uh, here you can have what I have. I know that I don't have a whole lot of experience. I, I know I don't have everything figured out, but I will offer what I can. And it just takes one just takes one. The thing about it is that 14-year-old lad could not have rescued the baby on his own. He could not have traversed down that pipe on his own. He, he couldn't have scaled the walls of that pipe, but he needed someone to hold the rope. He needed someone. He needed someone from an older generation that was strong enough to hold him and hold the child. He needed someone from an older generation that was willing to pull him back up out of the darkness. He needed someone else Today, I wonder if there are any young people that are willing to make themselves available. I wonder as we stand, if there are any young people that would go into this school year with a willing heart, with a desire to traverse down the well pipe, because it just takes one this morning. There's someone in your class that's trapped in the darkness, someone that needs a Christian to stand up. Someone that says, I'll come down and grab you. Jude 122 talks about snatching them from the fire. I wonder if there is a young person this morning that's willing to snatch someone from their class out of the fire. A young person that's willing to snatch someone from the pipe. A young person that's willing to yield their loaves and their fish. I, I hope that you can get the metaphors this morning, right? They're just, God's looking for someone that's available. God's looking for a young person that says, God, you can have what I have. It may not be much, God, but here I am. And maybe you don't have the Holy Ghost yet. And you want it of all the school supplies that you can have this year to prepare yourself to go back to school. The Holy Ghost is the number one thing that you need. And you can come up to these altars here in a second as I open them. And you can lift up your hands and God can change your life forever by filling you with his spirit. Because it just takes one service for God to change your life forever. And likewise, Elder, I wonder if there is someone that's willing to support these young people as they go back to school. I wonder if there's someone that's willing to support and endorse them with your prayers. I wonder if there's an elder here this morning that would say, Jesus, there's a lad here. There's a lad here. All across the altar this morning, I have papers with students' names on them. These are names of students in our church that are going back to school, whether it be preschool, whether it be college, elementary, middle, high school. Regardless of the school that they're going back to, I promise you this, they need your prayers. Regardless of whatever grade they're entering to this year, they need your support. They need your prayers, church. They need someone to hold the rope for them. Amen. I open up these altars to these young people and to these adults, and I ask you, is there anyone that would come up and take a piece of paper? Anyone that would say, you know what? I don't know what you're going to face, young person, this year. I don't know what form of temptation you're going to face, but I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to endorse you. I'll hold the rope for you as you venture down the pipe to save another. 
I wonder if there are any young people that would come down to these altars and lift up their hands and lift up their voice and say, Jesus, whatever you have to be done in my school this year, God, I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it, God. I make myself available. You can have my loaves and my fish, God. You can have what I have, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God has ordained you, young people, for this. God has called you. He's equipped you for this. There's going to be revival in our schools this year. There's going to be revival in this church this year through our youth group. He is able and he is willing. The only question is, is there just one person this morning that would make up in their heart, that would make up in their mind, that they're going to do all that they can to make themselves available to the Lord's will? God, whatever you'd have to be done in Jesus' name, let it be done in my classroom, God. Whatever you'd have to be done in this student's life, God. I pray a hedge of protection about them. I pray a hedge of protection about their minds, about their hearts, God. I pray that you would be with them this year, God. In Jesus' name. Come on. Come on, Elder. We got some papers up here. They need somebody to hold the rope for them. They need somebody to hold the rope for them. They need somebody to hit their knees and pray for them when no one else will. They need someone to make up the in the middle of the night and call out their name in prayer. They need someone that would wage war against the gates of hell. That they would, would in the name of Jesus. Come on, young people, pray this morning. Pray like your prayers matter. Pray like your prayers are going to keep your friends out of hell. Come on, pray for your teammates this morning. Pray for your classmates this morning. In the name of Jesus, baptize us with a willingness, Lord God. 